Hello, welcome back. Please ignore the giant pile of laundry you can see behind me. I am an adult and I am incapable of scheduling my time. I really like this lipstick. I like this lipstick so much. I forgot that I had this lipstick and then I rediscovered it uh, last week and I am living for it. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the books that are in February, which are books. Things that I finished in February. So February was a, a weird, interesting kind of a reading month. I made progress on my Goodreads Want to Read challenge that I set for myself, mostly by DNFing the things that I couldn't make my way through, and then inhaling an entire series in kind of a binge read situation. So yeah, let's get into it. This is not in any particular order because there's no reason. There's no reason for it. I just didn't feel like putting it in order. It's not in chronological order because I don't remember the chronological order that well. I could figure it out with my spreadsheet, but like it's not easy because I didn't put them into the spreadsheet in the order that I finished them. I put them into the spreadsheet in the order that I started them and that's, you know, not... Right, like it would, it would take some reordering and that would be annoying, so I'm not gonna do that. Well, let's, let's start with, there is a book that I had to read for school that I read the entire book. Um, this isn't the actual book that I had to read because it's a story. Um, this book is called Arranging and Describing Archives and Manuscripts. This one is by Dennis Meissner and uh, came out... what's the copyright on this guy? And this is copyrighted to 2019. For class, the bookstore ordered the 2019 version, but we were actually supposed to read the edition directly before this one. So I own the new edition because I figure in terms of my future career as an archivist, knock on wood, that this new edition will be more useful than the old edition. But I had to read the old one for school. So I read Arranging and Describing Archives and Manuscripts by Kathleen Rowe, which was a book that I read for school. Usually if I'm required to read a book for school, and a lot of the time even nonfiction books that I read for fun don't tend to vary very much in terms of rating, I usually give them three stars because they are cool and acceptable and I don't have a very critical eye when it comes to reading nonfiction. Was that a time? So in February, I read the entire Immortals series the, um, by, by Tamara Pierce, which includes Wild Magic, Wolf Speaker, um, Emperor Mage, and Realm of the Gods. And I read the first three in like four days because uh, they were all available through the library in ebooks and I just I got to the end of one and I was like well time to go to the next one uh, and then I had to wait for the last one for like a week because of holds hold schedules at the library and I finally got the last one and that one took me a lot longer to get through I don't I think part of it has to do with um, the scope and the scale of the book uh, and what it was trying to do uh, I personally felt like book four was less successful than books one through three. I think three is my favorite of the series. Um, main character is named Dane and she has wild magic where she can talk to animals and things like that and her magic develops over the course of the series. Um, She's really cool. There's some problematic stuff about the series uh, because it's it's older and so there's a couple of things that we've learned as a culture since then that we didn't know at the time um, and things like that. So like it's I feel like it's a it's a series where it's you go into it with a little bit of a grain of salt of like this has a couple of problematic things in it 
it's still enjoyable. We can recognize that those things are problematic and enjoy it at the same time, right? It was a good series in general. I'm, I'm slowly but surely making my way through all of the Tamara Pierce backlog that I haven't read yet, um, and I'm on hold at the library for more of that to come, so in the future, but currently it's... that's not what I'm reading right now. But like, we're, we're making progress, and that's kind of what this is. Uh, all of my Tamara Pierce backlog was right at the beginning of my Goodreads Want to Read challenge, and so I'm getting through it right now, because that's all at the beginning of the list, which is useful. Yeah, so I read all four of those in February. I didn't think I was going to finish the last one, but then I pushed through the ending. The other one that I... oh, okay. and, then, and then I guess the rest of them are all things that I DNF'd. Which isn't, I don't know, it's it's not too successful of a listing, I don't think. It's not too successful of to DNF. I DNF'd three things last month. I got stuck uh, and, and couldn't finish and decided I wasn't going to finish three whole things. That seems like a lot. So let's get into those, I guess. First one is this book called A Woman Looking at Men Looking at Women. There's a sticker covering part of the subtitle. Uh, oh, the, so the subtitle is Essays on Art, Sex, and the Mind um, by Siri Hustvelt. Hustvet? Hustvet? I don't know how you say it. Hustvetted. This book... <sighs> the first section of this book is a collection of very short essays. Uh, each on a different art piece, talking about it through a different, you know, theoretical lens. It's very art analysis, literary analysis kinds of a focus, um, and I thought that was really interesting. And then I got to part two, when she really started talking about the science of psychology and things like that uh, in, in great detail, and I didn't care and I couldn't force myself through it. I also find that there's a couple of things, the way she I don't love a lot of her perspectives on the world. I think she is obsessed with Freud and Freudian analysis, and I think Freud is a hack. Right, like he's been disproven so many times, I don't think it's useful to use Freud. So I had a lot of difficulty with reading her work because she clearly sets a lot of store by Freud and Freudian theory and psychoanalysis and those kinds of things. She. I like her I like her focus on interrogating the world around her and how she really pushes for don't believe everything you read like in, interrogate those things and, and don't just accept what the world tells you. I just personally don't agree with her conclusions in in those interrogations, those things that she's interrogating I I have interrogated them in my own way, and I have come to very different conclusions than she has come to, and so that was really grating. And especially when I got to part two, and I could not push myself through this. I did not want to. I still don't want to. But I did really like part one. I thought that was interesting, at least. It's nice to see different perspectives, even if I don't agree with all of them. Yeah, but in the end I couldn't take the focus on Freud. I can't take the focus on sex. I don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. Maybe that's an ace thing, but like... Why do you have to make everything about sex? Yeah, so that. There's that. I DNF'd that one. Did not love it. What else did I DNF? There were two other things. Oh yes, so I DNF'd The Recruit by Robert Muchamore. This was one of my uh, Goodreads want to read list books. And I DNF'd it because it got really violent really fast. It took too long to get to the spy part that I thought, like, the, the part that I wanted, right? The reason I wanted to read The Recruit is like a teen spy book, and that was why I wanted to read it. And it took way too long to even get there, and then when it did get there it was being weirdly, like, moralistic and, like, violent. Uh, there was this whole, like, the whole first section of the book didn't make a lot of sense and I didn't know what it was trying to say and I didn't know where it was going and I just was not having fun. Um, like I fully read the first 30 pages and then I skimmed the next like 70 to kind of see what happened and, and to kind of see like when we get to the spy part which is the part I wanted to read 
and we didn't get to it for like a hundred pages and when we did get to it it was like really violent and kind of I don't know I don't want to say gory but it was like there's a scene where the main character like is like a 12 year old child and the adult in the room you know they're performing a test to see if he's good enough to be a spy and the adult in the room is like hey murder this chicken as like a, a test of their their moral fortitude which is like I don't know I feel like that's more of the timbre of like an adult spy book and I didn't want the, that timbre of violence and like is it moral to kill because someone orders you to in like a teen spy book where the main character's like 12 right like I was <laughs> and then I didn't like it I did not like that at all so we stopped reading it the last one that I DNF'd actually makes me a little sad and I might I don't know I'm, I'm kind of I'm honestly still a little on the fence about it so I might go back to it if I get too curious about what happens but like so I started reading Evernight by Claudia Gray which is a vampire romance novel from the early 2000s and I thought I knew where it was going really like I really did I didn't read the summary like too closely right like I read it just enough to kind of get a, a, a feeling of what the book was gonna be about but I don't you know I don't memorize the summaries on the backs of books before I go into them and it's been a long time since I've really read that one um, but right it was like gothic boarding school the main character doesn't fit in the love interest looks like he fits in but he doesn't actually like he doesn't agree with them and he he doesn't emotionally fit in or whatever and like all of this kinds of stuff and you know that it's vampires right like it's in the paranormal romance section you can you can it's really really easy to know that it's vampires and i was i was liking it i was liking it we were getting along and everything was fine and i hit this point about halfway through the book where there was a plot twist that was really fun and really fascinating and took things in a direction that I was not expecting at all, which is rare when it comes to like those kinds of stories. I really enjoyed the plot twist itself, but then the author did this thing that I really, really hate in books, where like the plot twist happens. Information is revealed to the reader that is has like not even been hinted at before. Right, like, not even hinted at. And then after the plot twist is, and the information is revealed to the reader, suddenly the main character has known about this plot twist the whole time, and there are hints retroactively added to the story that is like telling you things that, like the character would have been thinking about these things before the plot twist. These things would have existed in their life before the plot twist, and those are like significant and notable details that would have been in the description of the story before the plot twist. Like we would have known before the plot twist, we would have been able to figure it out from context clues except for the fact that the author specifically withheld those details just so they could have this really surprising plot twist and then after the fact be like oh by the way she knew the whole time like this isn't a plot twist to this isn't a surprise to the main character it's only a surprise to the reader which really bugs me because you can you can feel like the hand of god right in the story shifting and changing things specifically to surprise you and like it breaks it breaks the reality of the world it breaks the reality of of you know, we're seeing the world through this main character's eyes, and if I can see that the author is holding something back, specifically something that, like, she would have been thinking about, she would have known, she would have, like, had those thought processes or, like, noted those details, right? If she was noting all of these other details, why did she specifically miss noting this one detail? And I was just kind of, I don't know, it bugs me so much when that happens. Um, there was another, the only other book that I really remember this happening in that really bugged me was like The False Prince, I think it's called. I think it's blue and it's called The False Prince. There's a broken crown on the cover, I think. But it's like the same thing kind of happens in that book where the first half of the book is like three street kids who are being groomed to become 
right, essentially like an, an Anastasia analog. They're right, like it's kind of an Anastasia story where they're like, they're, you know, some, some uh, guy is like, hey, the prince is gone and we need a new prince, so we're gonna train one of you to play the prince and whoever plays the prince the best gets to become literally like a royal. Right, but the caveat is you have to be my pawn politically, right? And this is the like, it's that kind of a thing. So it's this competition. There's three guys in the competition, and halfway through the book, spoiler alert, you find out that the viewpoint character is actually just the prince. And has been the prince the whole time. He ran away from home and has like become entered in this contest by chance in some ways or whatever. And he's just actually the prince, even though this whole time, you know, the whole first half of the book, he wasn't apparently thinking about his history at all. And like, in the contest, he isn't even like preternaturally good at these things and like way better than the others. He's just, you know, doing, but like, the twist comes out of nowhere. And then after the fact, you find out that the viewpoint character that you've been living in the whole time has known this twist the whole time and just apparently didn't think about it for 150 pages. I'm supposed to believe that the runaway prince didn't think about the fact that he was a runaway prince for 150 pages? Please. So yeah, Evernight did one of those and I kind of want to know what happens, but I also kind of don't care now that I can like that, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, that is the kind of thing that ruins a book for me. That just makes it like, I can't believe any of it. Like I, I, the, the verisimilitude of the world is completely shattered. I don't believe in the world anymore. I don't believe in the characters. The hand of God is too obvious. And I know that the, the author is like, I feel like on some level, you always know that the author is like, you know, manipulating the world so that you only know certain things. But I don't want to feel that happening. And if I can feel it happening, it means something has gone awry. So that was my experience with Evernight. Really, my, my experience with reading these books that have been on my TBR shelf the longest is mostly negative. In some ways, it's like, there's a reason you didn't read this back when you wanted to the first time, and that reason is still real. Some of it is that my tastes have changed, some of it is that I am more ruthless with letting things go in this process than I have been. Right, like, in the past I probably would have pushed through the rest of Evernight, I probably wouldn't even have, like, right, I would have felt, like, betrayed as a reader by the plot twist, but it wouldn't have been enough to really push me over the edge into saying, well, I'm just gonna DNF this because it's not what I want. Um, but, like, I've given myself that permission, and so, you know, it's, it's helping me get through these things a little bit faster. It's also helping me have a better reading experience in general because I don't take the time to focus on stuff that I don't need to. Have a lovely life, read some lovely books.